Welcome back to Opera Off Stage. I'm Jesse, and I'm Michelle. And today we are talking about opera drama, specifically singer drama. So we're going to talk about some rivalries, some feuds, some dropped contracts, and just about everything in between. This episode's going to be pretty juicy, y'all. So grab some snacks and uh, settle down. The first feud we're going to get into is Maria Callas and Renata Tibaldi. I actually didn't know too much about this feud until we started writing for this episode, but that really gets me is that Tibaldi was quoted as saying, I have one thing that Callis doesn't have, a heart, which is wild. Like, that's that's a deep cut. And yeah. Callis said comparing herself with Tibaldi was like comparing champagne with cognac, which some people say she compared champagne and Coca-Cola, whatever. You get the idea. Things were getting pretty spicy between these two ladies. Uh, and generally what people put it down to is Callis was an incredibly expressive singer, but the tone of her actual voice wasn't everyone's cup of tea, whereas Tibaldi had like a more traditionally beautiful sound. And so a lot of people liked one or the other. And so that kind of fed into this idea of a rivalry. But what really kind of kicked it off was at 1951, they were doing a concert together in Brazil and they had agreed that nobody would do an encore, which is a fine agreement between the two people because sometimes those things go on forever. But instead, Tibaldi took two encores and Callis was furious. Which is also fair, because when you agree to take none, taking two is a lot. I really love this, because we're going to get into this later. But it's really interesting to me how these kind of like opera camps, these like two, the audience is associated with any given artist in the 50s, 60s, 40s, especially. They were so obsessed that they would intentionally ruin productions of singers that they didn't like. Oh, yeah. And... It's not shocking to me because obviously when we're thinking about opera in this context in the 50s of this like golden era of singers, the hype, so to speak, around opera was so different than what it is today. And, you know, I feel like everybody knows concert etiquette and we've moved away from stuff like that, even though it still happens. But, oh, my gosh, in some of these stories, I'm just shocked at people, how people acted in the opera house, because now it's like oh my gosh, if somebody chews or breathes too loudly next to me, I'm furious. I can't even imagine somebody wailing or purposefully interrupting a show. Oh, yeah. Well, and I, people really fed into this rivalry. Like, this is a pretty prime era of, like, the operatic diva. And so people looked at it and they wanted to see that kind of tension. They wanted to have this. Because in reality... These are two very different singers trained in almost entirely different schools of singing. Yeah. The fact that you would compare them at all just because they're both sopranos is kind of silly. Yeah, well, I feel like whenever you have two equally talented people rising at the same time, people want to make drama out of it. And even if they're... uh, These kind of things always get blown out of proportion. There might be some unpleasant interaction between the two, but then the press and the the opera camps are going to be like... Ah, it's the end of the world. They hate each other. Blah, 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 you know? Yeah. No, that's definitely exactly what it is. Here's the funny thing about it, because this is a a big rivalry that was pretty well covered during the time. And like I said, the audiences were super in on it. But if you go back, they also talk about... Tibaldi speaks very highly of Maria Callas and talks about how she had some definitive recordings that she would listen to while preparing roles. And Callas essentially says the same of Tibaldi. And they both agree later later in life, that really a lot of it was hyped up by the media, but that they fed into it because it was so good for their careers. So they're really kind of the OG fake drama. Stuff like we see on YouTube today, where people make up fights with these other creators because they know it gets attention. Right. (laughs) That is essentially what this is. Which is also incredible, because they just basically played everybody. So true. Just for the sake of getting people to come to their shows and be enthusiastic supporters. Yeah, and they knew they'd be on headlines, you know? And I can't blame them. Yeah, even Callis actually says, like, when she speaks about Tibaldi, she says, sometimes I actually wish she, I had her voice, which is a pretty high compliment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think one of the, the sweeter things was that supposedly, according to Time Magazine, when Maria Callis quit performing at La Scala, Tibaldi uh, said she wouldn't sing at La Scala without Callis. And not necessarily in the same show, but in the same season. Which is very sweet. That is very sweet. We love our leading yeah. ladies. A lot of times things are hyped up by the news and everything because it just is more interesting than being like, there are two great singers and they're friends. 
Yeah. Everybody wants the juicy, the juicy gossip, you know? And to be... I'm not saying they never talk trash about each other. They definitely did because there are quotes of it. I'm just saying probably in the long run, a little more friends than foes. Yeah, especially towards the end of their lives. They were definitely not keeping up with this nonsense. But to be fair, though, it is pretty interesting how, you know, Maria Callas really... I don't want to say that she wasn't a good colleague to other people because that would be false. But she definitely had some interesting rehearsal ticks i suppose of always wanting like the absolute max dress rehearsals and like just rehearsing things to death that nobody else wanted to do which is one of the things that made her so great but i think also so difficult to work with for other singers at the time which is why you see her have so many myths with all these other singers that she performed with you know yeah okay this is like one of my favorite favorite little stories of Maria Callas and Mario Del Monaco. So if you don't know Mario Del Monaco, you should definitely go listen to him. He was very funny in that his little title, since all these singers in the 50s had these titles, he was the Brass Bull of Milan. And he was known for literally being a tenor and singing everything loud. So... (laughs) Basically, the way this went down was in his 1955 season at La Scala, Callas and Delmonico were supposed to schedule to do a production of Verdi's Il Travatore, but Delmonico, for some reason, a week before, said he was too indisposed and vocally tired to sing the role. So somehow his logical decision was to substitute Il Trovatore for a performance of Andrea Chernier, which... If you know, this is a ridiculous decision because this opera is an absolute tenor opera. It has large arias in each of the four acts. It has several big duets. So this is like going from, I mean, not to say that the Verdi isn't already a big sing, but if you could go to a bigger tenor opera, this is it. So he's just flexing. And it's really funny because he was the bigger star at the time which is interesting to think of when we think about Maria Callas, but he was the bigger star, so he got his way and the program was switched. So you can kind of get the idea that this is probably just a power move to really just steal the limelight from Callas. But you know what? The joke ended up being on him because in true Callas fashion, she learned the role of Madalena in five days and absolutely crushed it. Which is just, like, so her, right? We love her because we know she's one of those singers that can just learn these insane roles that take people today, months to learn, in a matter of days. And it was very interesting because she didn't really fault him for changing the opera because, you know, God knows that if anybody could learn it that quickly, it was her. But people, like, in these little opera parties were blaming her for changing the season and she was like no no that was not me I did not change this opera like a week before it was supposed to go up it was him I mean that's insane and it was just so interesting it it baffles my mind to think that anyone would have the power to change an opera the week before because it's not just the singers that are there there's a chorus there's an orchestra yeah it really doesn't make any sense to me how they could just completely scrap a probably fully fleshed production and then just... What about the set? The cost? I, I, maybe I, I have to imagine that either this was slated for later in the season or like they had just done it because I just, my brain, I'm lost. <laughs> well, it's just such a funny flex for Delmonico because, you know, at this point, when we're talking about in Milan, he's number one, right? But... Callas had been growing exponentially at the time. Yeah. So for him to just be like, I'm going to get her. And then why would you even try? Because you should know that she learns these insane roles in a matter of days. If anybody's going to get it, it's her. Yeah. I always just am like so amused by that. Yeah. And like another little side story is like with the famous Boris Kristoff, who was like a big Boris Gudunov base known for yeah. his very difficult offstage relationships with his fellow singers. So he had a lot of fallouts with a lot of people. He is just kind of another one of those people that was known for being a fabulous performer, but not a good castmate. Callas and Kristoff were both scheduled to be in Medea in a production in Rome. And this whole evening was basically like just a nightmare. 
Maria Callas, in her typical fashion, requested the max number of dress rehearsals, as she always does. And the rest of the cast was upset because they were like, this is so tiring and excessive. Why? Why? Why do we have to sing and be here for so long? Her being her got her way anyways. And I guess like backstage during one of the performances, Callas and Kristoff had this violent disagreement. And basically... It resulted with Kristoff blocking Collis' attempt to solo bow, and it was just a nightmare. Like, she went to bow, and he straight up was so furious with her that he just stepped in front of her. If you're an opera singer, I can't even imagine having, like, the balls to do that to another singer. What I love about this, though, is, like, this is the opera singer thing. Which is, like, you're not really going to actively fight people in any physical manner. You're just going to be so incredibly petty (laughs) <laughs> because yeah. let's be honest uh, of all the things he's not affecting her career he's not affecting her job prospects he's literally just stepping in front of her during a bow which on the surface level is uh, nothing but petty it really is like level 100 petty that's what i love about most of these though like i said the revenge is always incredibly just <laughs> ridiculous Oh, absolutely. I'm going to change an entire opera the week before. I'm going to step in front of you during your solo bow. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, For my next one, I went way, way back. During the time of Handel in in London, there are really these two leading sopranos. One's technically a mezzo, but they're multiple times over referred to as both being the leading sopranos. So we'll run with it. They notoriously hated sharing the stage with each other, but they were such big draws for crowds that composers all over London would write operas for two leads, essentially writing the shows for them and forcing them to be on stage together. Oh, no. But they were super careful about it. One of the things we forget is that a lot of operas were pretty heavily affected by the singers they wanted the star in them. So a lot of these operas had very equal female roles because otherwise it would have started a huge fight. True. The other thing that really cracks me up about this is when you read about them, their names are Francesca Cuzzoni and Faustina Bordoni. Faustina Bordoni is straight up referred to as much younger and prettier, (laughs) which I I think is a wild thing to think about, I guess, just because that means that somewhere from operas back in 1722, somebody wrote that down and published it because we still know. That's amazing. Spread the word. Faustina's a hottie. Faustina's a hottie. (laughs) And Cuzzoni was not, apparently. (laughs) Oh, no. But their animosity towards each other on stage was so obvious that, like with Callas and Tibaldi, the audience starts taking sides. Now, unlike with Tibaldi and Callas, opera during this era was kind of the Wild West. So people are straight up yelling when people come on stage, so much so that you can't even hear the music. They are booing the other singers so loudly that you cannot hear an entire orchestra and the singer. I can't even imagine. Imagine paying to go to an opera just so you can boo people. What do you do? (laughs) Exactly. Right? That's a flex. (laughs) But like, how? It's not even that though. How were they so loud that they covered literally the opera itself? The other thing that like is crazy though is they would not only go there and do these incredibly loud boos, they would also dress up like their favorite singer to make it clear who they supported. I love it. Which once again, what a what a thing. <laughs> bring bring that back. <laughs> bring that tradition back. But once again, like I said, they were fighting so much that at one point a full-on riot breaks out in the audience, which then pushes the singers oh. over the edge and they start tearing each other's costumes up and literally (gasps) fighting on stage and they had to be dragged off what (laughs) i don't know why i just like assume these things don't happen in good old handle times but i guess they happened more than ever but oh my gosh can you imagine falling off and being dragged from the stage as you're like fighting your your co-star Like, I can't even imagine. Can you imagine how crazy the audience must have been at that point? Yeah, that's the thing. Like, that's the wildest thing I've ever heard of. I can't Like, imagine being at the Met and watching (laughs) just, like, Natalie Desai and Deanna Damrau get into a fist fight. Like, I genuinely cannot even imagine it. It, it. It shocks the mind. So, what the theater then does is they try to cancel Kutsoni 
who we will refer to as the less attractive one, they try to cancel her contract. But the king, the king gets so mad and threatens to pull funding from the theater. So they have to keep her there. Wow. So they they keep showing up in productions, but they eventually solve the problem by paying Kutsoni one guinea less than Bordoni. She's so upset by getting one guinea less than Bordoni that she immediately resigns and moves back to Italy. I love this example because this is like an actual feud. Like the feud to end all feuds. (laughs) Unlike... Callas and Tabaldi, you know? This is, like, the just the craziest thing. But I also, once again, incredibly petty to pay bo- a person one less guinea in order to make them resign. Right. But also knowing that that would work. What a time. And not only does she resign, she full-on moves to another country. <laughs> She's like, I can't even be... I can't breathe your air. I have to be as far away as possible. Yeah, excuse me. I need to go literally anywhere else. That's so funny. Yeah, opera was a much different thing (laughs) during that era, Uh, and so was the audience. I don't even really know what to compare it to. I mean, sports, maybe? But sports was not this... Yeah, I guess sports, because, like, sports have caused riots True, but I also feel like... I I guess, like, the difference is, like, teams, I feel like, have feuds, right? But you don't often have, like, individual players that are fighting with other individual players to the point where they literally have to move to a different area you know <laughs> yes like, i don't, I don't think, think i've ever seen type someone of pettiness move to exists another. anymore which is good but i i love I'm, it <laughs> oh my gosh don't get yeah. me wrong i'm glad people don't fist fight at operas and i'm glad people don't riot at operas you know, I, I would love to move people emotionally, but I, I really would rather not move them to, to punch their neighbor. That's true. I really don't want to see anybody being dragged off of the Met stage. Yeah, but just never forget, like, opera being a classy medium isn't true. <laughs> its history is not always classy. No. Oh, yeah. All these people just have, like, way too many emotions and hormones and, and egos. It's, it's a bad mix sometimes. Yeah, well, and this, this too is, like, right around the era where you start seeing, like, opera divas and stars and, like, people right. who are, operas are written for these singers, you know? Not, this isn't the absolute beginning of that, but it, that's star power. Right. Yeah. Yeah, these, like, central figureheads that really kind of call the shots. Exactly. Uh, you definitely see this in Handel's time, for sure, and Mozart's time. And then it just kind of continues on. And then I feel like the next big resurgence is, like, in the 50s when we have La Divina and all of these people. But I really wonder what it would have been like. Because this doesn't exist today anymore, really. Not in the sense that it did be- in the past. But I wonder what it would have been like to be a singer that truly has control over these opera houses. I mean, you say that. I, we, we did just talk about a guy who changed an entire uh, opera in a week. And that was 1950s. So that's not actually terribly, too terribly long ago. Mm-mm. No. But, like, that doesn't really happen in, like, in opera now. I mean, every no. once in a while, yes, we still have these, like, big issues where shows get changed. But it's not usually because of any one artist yeah, in the in the in the same. Gravity. Well, usually if something happens, like they just replace. You. Yeah, exactly. Like the show goes on and they find somebody else who sings the role, and that's it. But I don't think this happens in any medium anymore. You know? Uh, no, they've reshot entire movies because an actor threw a fit. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. I just wonder what would it have been like to have the type of power where your draw on the audience, your like star power, so to say is so big that you literally make the decisions for an opera house. Like, you go over the heads of any sort of, like, general manager, conductor, director, staff, people. And you're just like, nope. Yeah. This is how it's going to be. And everybody's like, it do be like that. It do be like (laughs) that sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, I can't even imagine. Just because even when we think about these huge stars today, they don't have that kind of power. At least most of the time. No. Not at, like, the big opera houses. There are obviously discussions, like, what shows are you interested in doing? Like, there is that kind of collaboration. But no, a a singer does not show up to an opera house and say, we're doing this this season. Right. Yeah. It's just so interesting. But then at the same time, I can understand how, like, the public was so much more interested in it, even outside of musical circles. 
you know, because you have all these figures that are feuding with one another and then you go and see their performance because you're kind of interested to know what the heck is going on according to these headlines. And then you see them and you're like, oh, wow, these people are incredible. Jesse, do you want to start a fake feud with me? <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, I think we're about to start a fake feud with this next story. Friendship with Michelle ended. <laughs> Um, okay, so if you want to talk about somebody who literally fought with everybody, we can't talk without bringing up Mr. Rudolph Bing. Bing had a full laundry list of feuds. I mean, you really could not find somebody who had more issues with all of these A-list artists at the time, which is just really funny because he is the bringer of so much good to the Met. And then he also just had issues with everybody. So he's a very funny person to read about. My favorite feud with Bing is definitely the one that he had with Beverly Sills. A, because I literally worship the ground that she walks on. And B, it all kind of was fixed in the end. But it's it's very interesting reading about Beverly Sills because she auditioned for Rudolph Bing like way earlier in, in her career. And he just kind of wasn't interested. And so she went over to New York City Opera and apparently, like, when she first auditioned for them, she auditioned seven times or some crazy number. You can fact check me. But they basically were like, beautiful instrument, no real personality, which which is wild. It's shocking to me because I really don't know who you think of higher personality wise than Beverly Sills. Can you really think of anybody who has more personality than Bubbles herself? I don't. I don't. I can't. I can't with that. See, and here's my thing. Beverly Sills is not my favorite soprano okay, in the world. That's my issue right here. But I this is the this is the start of our feud. <laughs> I know she's a great soprano. I'm not denying that. I'm just saying if I'm listing off my favorite sopranos, she's not necessarily right at the top. But her stage presence is absolutely undeniable. Like I would never. I think the thing that gets me about Beverly Sills is I just when I watch her, yes, I'm stunned by her voice. I could listen to her for hours, but watching her I don't know how she constantly looks so pleasant and at ease when she sings. It's truly a talent. Oh, so because true. Because when she, she's one of the few people that I genuinely feel like looks happy when she sings something happy. You know what I mean? Like, it's really easy to just, like, turn up the drama when you're singing a sad aria. But to genuinely look actually joyful when you're singing a happy aria is a real skill. And she always just looks so happy that i really as I aspire to be happy like beverly sills <laughs> for those who have missed this in previous episodes michelle's audition package is incredibly sad and dramatic i just want to be <laughs> i just want to be happy <laughs> that's true though like it's it's hard to like be genuinely happy on stage and she she really does just exude joy and even in in ones that are like a more mixed emotion I do consider her one of the best recordings of Willow Song from Ballad of Baby Doe. And that that song has a ton of mixed emotions in it. And I think she plays them so beautifully. Yes. And I love her voice in that aria. Because I know I know you're coming for me now that I've mentioned that she's not my I'm, favorite soprano. I'm literally at your throat. <laughs> but yeah, so she, she basically, she auditioned for New York City Opera and they were like, no personality, which is shocking to me and upsetting. But anyways. Also factually incorrect. Just, just straight up wrong <laughs> basically she ended up making it big you know 10 years later when she did Giulio Cesare and after that she just exploded and this is one of the reasons that I also really love her because she's one of those American singers that really made her mark in the opera world and performed at you know most of the big opera houses around the world without needing the Met which didn't really happen you know, yeah. her career is so interesting to think about. I think that a big part of the reason Rudolf Bing didn't want her was because he was kind of in this mindset that for the most part, American singers just don't compare to European singers. And so it was just like always this interesting dynamic because obviously we also had Leontine Price, who he really brought in as another American soprano. So it's just kind of interesting to see this weird dichotomy yeah, he definitely was, like, of a split mind. Yeah. Because there were American singers that he really helped their careers. Yeah. But he definitely, definitely had, like, a preference for established European singers. Right. Uh, and it's, once again, kind of that difference in, like, schools of thought in terms of how you learn yeah. to sing. Yeah. So it's just, it was so interesting, their feud. 
I mean, her being able to kind of like make it, so to speak, without performing at the Met is like her entire her legacy, I suppose. It's just it's yeah, crazy. absolutely. But regardless, I just I I'm still not over the whole no personality thing. That that is still because one of one of the things we can't I actually, move on from that. <laughs> the Ballad of Baby Doe. Well, because it's completely opposite of how I feel. The thing that that I don't necessarily like about Beverly Sills is, let me say this, she's an incredibly talented soprano, and I, I recognize her talent and her skill and her training and all the work she puts into what she does. It is literally just like a, a voice thing in terms of preference. Okay, well, you're wrong, but I, One continue. of the things I love the most, <laughs> fair enough, <laughs> um... <laughs> Listen, Michelle, we're allowed to like different no. things. <laughs> um, yes, but not this one. <laughs> you can't disagree with me on one this one. One of the things I especially love about her is that she would go on shows and like there's a there's a really funny performance of her singing with Danny Kay where she sings part of an aria and then he he uh well I don't know how to put what he does. It's a comedy routine and it's it's just fabulous oh yeah she was on tv all the time she was one of those singers but i love that that was really fun i love people who go out there and mix things up and like went on these variety shows and like played the comedy of it all and i i really i appreciate oh that. yeah beverly sells once again i'm going to clarify to you and anyone who wants to have a bone to pick with me i'm not saying beverly sills is a bad soprano she's an incredibly incredibly skilled soprano I have a personal preference. Listen, we already know that Beverly Sills is amazing, okay? We're just trying to get you to love her. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Why don't you love her? Oh, we're trying to get you to join. This really is the end of our <laughs> we're friendship. We're trying to get you to join the cult, Jesse, and you're just making it really hard on us. No, but it's it's just interesting. So she basically goes off to do Giulio Cesare. It's an absolute hit. Everybody goes over to see what the heck is going on over at New York City Opera. <clears throat> and then, you know... Fast forward, finally, at 45, she makes her Met debut in the Siege of Corinth, and fans literally paid up to like $500 to see her on opening night, and they cut off a singer mid-phrase as soon as Sills stepped onto stage and gave her a two-minute ovation. That was like how excited Sills fans and just opera fans in general were for her to make her final debut, or her debut at... The Met, her, her final, final debut, <laughs> her debut at the Met. Like people were just so excited. Something that I read that was just so good from the very sassy Harper Crimson at the time was that at the end of the performance, performer mezzo Shirley Verrett was also in this production of the Siege of Corinth, and she's fabulous. And they went on about talking about how the fans of you know this mezzo were still had so much to prove that after she finished her solo they gave her a five minute ovation there was like rhythmic pounding on the floor everybody's shouting like brava diva like all those things they were literally like showering shredded programs from the top of the balcony like these people just felt like they needed to steal the show for the singer aside from sills and they literally wrote in this article that the Sills fans were wealthier and they threw bouquets of roses from the first tier boxes instead. And I was just like, even the people who write about opera hilarious. are so petty. I love it so much. It is just. That's so true, though. It's so good. It's interesting because, you know, we always think like, oh, my God, Rudolph Bing is like such a bad guy for not giving her a chance. Like, how could he not see her success? Like, literally <laughs> so close. <laughs> at new york city opera but this is another example of just kind of like the the myth right the the fake feud and not to say that there was not a feud there definitely was you can read quotes about them to each other but i think that the fans loved this idea of her being able to just do what she did without him and having him nagging at her and it just didn't really matter that they just really boosted up this idea of this feud. Oh, the absolutely. fans wanted the drama to be there. They loved this story of her being able to go off and do what she did. That is not to say that when she was singing with New York City Opera and around the world that Rudolph Bing didn't eventually give her opportunities to sing at the Met. That's not true. He did. But later in life, Beverly Sills was pretty candid about what those contracts that Rudolph Bing extended to her contained which was, you know, a combination of pretty 
bad roles, old productions, or performance dates that being new conflicted with her commitments to sing somewhere else. And in one instance, he sent her a contract that would conflict with her debut at Covent Garden. So it's like, obviously, she's not going to take it. You know, it's like inviting somebody to the party knowing yeah. that they have to be somewhere else. It's just, it's it's a little, it's a little shady. <laughs> Bev goes on to say later that there was a misconception that she never invited him to sing there. She also just like kind of throws light shade and that she's like, yeah, when they sent me those contracts, you know, I just didn't care much for the repertoire suggested by the Met. So it's just really funny. Which is also a subtle I know. burn. I love, I love this feud for some reason because it is very harmless, you know, because they were both so successful and they didn't really need each other. But everybody just kind of expected yeah. her to sing at the Met because that's kind of when you're at that level, that's just kind of what you do. And so it's just very interesting, their little relationship. And she's just like, I don't even need no. to. And in the end, they were they were very friendly. And she did several productions at the Met. And, you know, everybody everybody loves a little Bev. The thing that you have to say about Bing is that he was, he was the general director there for 22 years. Yeah. You are inevitably going to end up having some issues with some singers. There's just no way. <laughs> well, he had um, issues with a lot of singers, but yeah. <laughs> to, you know, praise Mr. Bingy Boy, he did so much to counteract that diva culture in the Met. He's the one that oh yeah, established that no matter how big of a star you are, you have to be there for the required rehearsals because he would have these singers left and right just not showing up to the rehearsals and he's like no it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter what kind of audience you attract we're all held to the same standard which is admirable we've been talking about diva culture and we're not saying that diva culture is good or should make a comeback no we're just kind of baffled by the fact that anyone ever had that much yeah. power and beverly sills is not a person i look at and think like wow she really abused that power we're going to get into some people who abuse their power in a bit. But first, I'm going to go back to what I was saying about wild audiences. Because there is one infamously wild audience that still exists. And that is the Loganisti in La Scala. So this is like a little group of cranky old men oh my gosh. <laughs> who are very much opera traditionalists. Like they, they're known for bringing their scores with them. They take issue with how people sing, if they change their vibrato, if, you know, if it's anything differing from what they think should be, or if it's like a new production instead of like a traditional production. They will take issue with anything and everything. And they are one of the few modern audiences who are known for booing. I hate that. Yeah, it's a huge issue. First of all, there are several managers of La Scala who have tried to like rein this in because they realize that singers don't want to be booed uh, and audiences don't want to listen to somebody heckle someone during an opera that they paid money to see. And one of the other funny things about it, so Loganisti, the it's actually the name of the group is talking about what are essentially the cheap seats. They're like the standing room only kind of, I, I forget if the actual word is balcony. You get my point. They are not like expensive box seats. There are many singers who have had issues with them. So there's a very famous tenor named Roberto Alagna oh, yeah. who left the stage during uh, the first scene of a production of Aida in 2006. Oh, shoot. Forcing his cover to go on in jeans and what they described as a sports shirt. I'm not sure what that means. But the fact that he had to go on stage while the soprano is in like full Ethiopian garb. And he went on in jeans because they had no choice because they started booing him and he was like, I'm not going to put up with it. And he just leaves, which honestly, I have some respect for that, for being like, I don't have to put up with this. I'm gone. And he's never performed at the theater again. He was scheduled to do another production of Verter in 2014, but he pulled out because he went to productions in the July of that year mm -hmm. and they were still booing. They bo booed almost every production in those two weeks. And he said, I'm not going to go through that again. I just don't have it in me. And the president of the Loganisti, which is actually called the Amici del Logioni Association. Oh, my God. Said that Alanya's reaction was infantile, which is a strong statement for someone booing you actively during an opera. Like, that's a that's a strong statement to make when you are yelling. Uh, he says, I don't think in July that there were many protests. And anyway, a serious artist must do his best, though he did admit that a few members might be spoiling things for the rest of them. That's crazy. So he's basically saying, 
it's only a couple people who are booing, which is clearly not true because there are so many singers who have had continuing issues. And you have to remember, that was 2014. That is only six years ago. It is insane to me to think of an audience where you could go out and be actively booed in today's age. Yeah. Especially because when we talk about Handel's era, everyone was doing it. That is like the general like feeling of the audience. That is not true for modern La Scala goers, which is why they've been trying to like rein these people in. Right. I personally hate it because these people are traditionalists and I think traditionalists hold back the progress of opera. So I'm very I'm very anti this on multiple levels. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's a whole um, different level of disrespectful. Like I don't care how much you don't like somebody's interpretation. You should never like interrupt the art that you paid probably like a couple it, hundred dollars to go see. <laughs> you know? You can dislike things and you can you can even not applaud. Like you could not applaud. And honestly, I'd even accept booing after the fact. Like if you boo at the end of the show or whatever, sure. But actively while someone is singing, that's insane. And they would heckle conductors too. Like there's video. It's it's wild. It's like at that point, just write a bad review. Don't interrupt the performance. Exactly. Like what what even is that? But you're ruining it for the other people who are there. And like I said, you can not clap. You can be quiet. You can cross your arms. You cannot stand when people do standing ovations. You know, there's tons of ways to express your distaste for something without being rude. Absolutely. And let's also be clear. When Alanya was like having this problem with them, they were actively throwing insults back and forth at each other, which is also wild to think about. But yeah, 2013 Polish tenor uh, Peter, I'm going to not get his name right, but Peter Bixala. Uh, also threatened to stop performing in the theater after he had been heckled. And all the way back to 1992, they booed Pavarotti <gasps> while he was singing Don Carlo because he had some voice cracks, which voice cracks just happen, especially when you're singing stressful roles. And that is like late Pavarotti, too. So it's not surprising that he might have had a couple voice cracks. Dang. And there's actually a video of them heckling uh, Cecilia Bartoli, who just handles it with so much grace. The, the conductor literally turns around and shushes the audience. And then they go into it. And it's clear that she's like, she's staring them down while she does her coloratura. It is kind of wild to think that like that was and maybe still is an issue. Like there are definitely singers who do not take roles at La Scala because it's just not worth it. So sad. Which is crazy because that's a top opera house. Like that is one of the biggest opera houses in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. That's like a huge career milestone. I just, I can't even imagine having the gall to yell at some of these singers. <laughs> this, this is what I wish would happen. I wish they would just pull a huge prank on these people. Just fill the audience with like friends and family of the people who work at the opera house, of the conductor, of the musicians, you know, just fill all of the rest of it with those people and then have obviously Lojanisti up in their, their area in the gallery. I believe that's actually what it is. And start the opera, and if they start to boo, everyone go quiet, like a teacher in an elementary room, and just be like, we'll wait. Honestly, I want the opera singers to start booing them back. I want the audience to boo them. Right? <laughs> exactly. That's what I want, though. I just want everyone to turn on them, because it's an incredibly vulnerable position. And it's, you know, there's not there's not really many careers where, where people will actively boo you if you're not perfect. Yeah. Uh, you know, you might write a bad review for a restaurant or something, but you wouldn't go into a kitchen and boo a chef. <laughs> oh, my God. <coughs> oh. Right? That's just not what we do anywhere else. No. That's amazing. I like to think of somebody like booing <laughs> Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> just be like, <laughs> that's amazing. There are many ways to express that you don't like something, and that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with saying, I didn't like this production or I didn't like how this singer did something, Michelle. Um, <laughs> Listen, the feud is still real. I have not heard you say that you love and will die for Beverly Seals, so my mission is not complete. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, but you also don't need to be yelling during a show because that's just disrespectful to the other audience members. Oh, yeah. Everything about it is bad. Moving out of La Scala and the Loganisti, I think probably the most modern, the most current diva we have is Anna Netrebko. Like, there's just not a doubt in my mind <laughs> that, like, she's the easiest person to pin down as not only a diva, but someone who... Well, she doesn't have a rivalry with anyone in particular. She's 
definitely made some enemies. I feel like Anna Netrebko is just one of those people that I don't know if she just talks too much. I just feel like she always just like says a little bit too much and then there's an issue. You know what I mean? Or she just she posts oh, something uh, wrong and then there and then people ask her about it and then she says too much and then it's just all bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? You are exactly correct. And let's talk about the time she said too much. So obviously we are still and were at this time going through the Me Too movement uh, where we found out that there were several prominent people in opera who had abused their power and taken advantage of people in multiple inappropriate ways. It's a very important thing for our industry to talk about, and it's an important thing that we still need to work on. Yep. Anna Dutrebko did not see it that way. <laughs> During an interview with her husband, she says, I will read the direct quote. When she was asked about allegations of sexual assault, when she was asked about the allegations against a couple of high-profile conductors at the time, she says, any of this sexual bullshit, we don't have it. I'm sorry, and I think it's total shit. But if you don't want, nobody will ever force you to do anything, never. If you did it, it means that you allowed that. No, that's not how that works. She added, in our profession, it's also absolutely not possible because if you're not talented, nobody will help you. You have to have a talent and you have to have a voice. You have to be somebody. I don't know how that has anything to do with anything in terms of people abusing their power. You can be incredibly talented and still have someone abuse their power over you. I, I, I'm not sure where she was even trying to go. But yeah, that's not how anything works. And just because you don't personally experience something doesn't mean it's ha not happening elsewhere. It was a terrible take. It was a terrible, terrible, stupid thing to say. And her, her husband fully backed her up. I won't get into the things he said because I don't care. It's not about him. So then when everyone immediately starts publishing what she said because it's in a video interview and it's, you know, very real and obvious and easy to prove what she was saying... She immediately tries to backtrack on Twitter and says, let me be clear, no victim of sexual assault is ever to blame. While in my career, I have never experienced what I'd call harassment, which is what I was referring to in this interview. I know it exists in every industry, including opera. I did not intend to suggest that any person, woman, other or otherwise is responsible for inviting inappropriate behavior. Now I'm going to go back to the previous quote I read. <laughs> but if you don't want, nobody will ever force you to do anything ever. If you did it, it means that you allowed that. Sorry, Anna, you can't just walk that back. You very clearly insinuated that any woman in that position had put herself in that position. You can't just sit there and be like, I didn't mean to mean that. I only said it aloud in front of a camera with a reporter. I have a really big issue with people now who are like, I'm sorry that you interpreted what I said that way. Or I'm sorry that you that's what you got from what I said. It's like, no, that what is that? Like, what even kind of BS excuse is that? It's like, you said it. There is a very limited amount of ways that you could interpret something like that. You know what I mean? It's like, what? To sit there and deny that anyone ever has experienced it. And to sit there and say, if you did experience it, it's your fault. Once again, is horrible. And a complete misunderstanding of how these power dynamics and stuff are so easily abused. Yeah. A terrible take. An absolutely awful take. And a terrible walk back of that take. Yeah. You know? That's the thing. She didn't just, like, apologize. She did exactly what you said. She did the, you're misunderstanding what I was trying to say, which is <laughs> nonsense. Like, she said very clearly what she thought. She just didn't like how people suddenly realized, oh, that's awful. That's a horrible, horrible take on this. Yeah. Ugh. PR disaster. <laughs> you could say, like, well, you know, maybe Anna Trebko has learned. No. Wrong. Incorrect. Because... Let's let me let me take you all the way to the long long ago time of June 2019 <laughs> when Natrebko posts a photo of herself in a Met production of Aida. Now a lot of us are familiar with this photo because Natrebko is in the modern version of blackface. It's a very deep tan that does not belong on a woman as white as she is, and it is obviously for a show that features prominently an Ethiopian character. So when somebody rightfully asks not even in a rude way. Somebody posted on her Instagram and said, is it really necessary to wear blackface for this show? Like, couldn't you just do it with your natural skin color instead of, you know, deep fake tanning? Yeah. And the Trebko, instead of giving any kind of nuanced answer, goes with blackface and black body for Ethiopian princess for Verdi's greatest opera. Yes! <laughs> uh, and I pronounce it that way because there were a lot of exclamation points. <laughs> yeah. 
when somebody questions whether something is blackface or not, the correct answer is not to say, yes, I absolutely support blackface. That's, that's a, once again, a terrible take. And honestly, she's not the only person to blame because the Met also signed off on that, which is also a terrible take. That's something we're going to discuss in a later episode about traditionalism in opera and how it heavily is influenced by racism. But that's not for today. Today we're just talking about Anna Netrebko and her social media presence uh, and her terrible takes. It really is. I remember when that was posted. I remember seeing that and immediately thinking, oh no, this is going to blow up. And it did. I remember seeing an article at the time that wasn't even like about opera. She was just, her picture was used as an example of modern blackface and like something that was not even about yeah. anything to do with the Met. Like they just used her picture. Like that's, it's just bad. And obviously, Anna Netrebko is not the only person that continues to make this mistake. This happens all the time. She's just perhaps one of the more notable figures that just doesn't handle this kind of situation well. But, oh, gosh, it's just so bad. I mean, I could understand them maybe yeah. like bronzing her up just a tiny bit because she is so incredibly pale. But to do, like, the seven shades darker that they put her in at the very they, least. They made her considerably Yeah, it's, like, darker. not even within the... the <laughs> possibility of her being able to get that dark and it's just wrong i mean she's a russian yeah, woman she's so light she is white white yes. oh gosh yeah there's just no need no one no one is gonna look at like a white aida and think like wow i really wish they had put her in blackface for this role my immersion is ruined it's an opera there's a lot of suspension of disbelief we go through for opera. Yeah. Yeah. Bad, bad choices all around on that one. But I just wanted to say that because there's just like, once again, maybe Anna Trebko should hire someone to start handling her PR for her. Yeah. Where are where are our Ethiopian singers? <laughs> Please come in. and it, That's also and, a good and, point. Uh, and sing the role instead. Yeah. We, we're... We're going to get into that in another episode where we're really going to dive in, in deep about issues with major operas and how opera houses are handling them for better or for worse. Here's another just kind of fascinating one. We were talking about star power, right? And the ability to change an opera on a moment, yeah. right? In 2016, 2017, she canceled two, perf- two runs of Norma, one with the Met and one with Covent Garden. She was asked in an interview, why do you sometimes withdraw from performances which have already been announced? And she said, as a rule, I signed contracts several years before the event. At the moment, it seems to me that I'll enjoy this part or that part, which I have not yet sung. After two or three years, I'll learn it um, with pleasure. But the time comes and I realize I don't like the part. So despite all my desire, you know, Norma didn't especially fit me. One of those performances was planned four years in advance. And she canceled really close to the date of the actual show. Ooh. Which is wild. But she said, like, my voice has changed and I don't think I should be singing this role anymore. Which is a fair choice to make as a singer. It sucks to make that decision so close to a show for the opera house. But I can understand, you know, any singer saying, I I don't think this is a good role for me to be singing. You don't want to ever get on stage and not be able to do it, right? Right. But then, then she does another interview in 2017, a year later, and she backwalks that and she's now honest about it. And she goes, I looked at the score. Honestly, I couldn't even finish listening to the opera. I'm being honest with you. It's so uninteresting for me. I don't like the music. I don't like the character. I tried because this project was very important. But in the end, I said, I can't. My heart is not there. And if it's not there, I can't do anything special with it. And that's the main reason I pulled out. She pulled out like months before this show because she, apparently she hadn't bothered to finish listening to the opera and didn't know that she didn't like it. That's crazy, right? I'm not crazy. That's crazy. No, that's pretty insane. And what I'm wondering is how she managed to have such a ginormous career and has not listened to Norma. <laughs> that's like, that's for... we got to take a step back. Like, how are you performing around the world season after season at the Met and you haven't listened to Norma? Well, for Covent Garden, too, this was her second cancellation within two years with them where she canceled the role. Though I think the previous one was in Faust. She canceled Norma. She she didn't cancel the show. They found out they're Sopranos. But she canceled her performances at Covent Garden and at the Met. And I just, I don't, I don't know why she would cancel them so late. I don't know how you don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Like, that's a pretty diva move to pull. Yes, that's definitely a modern diva kind of move. But that is just, like, so, that's very interesting to me. Because... Also, I don't know. 
I mean, if you're to to say, I don't think that I will do this role well, I don't like it. I feel like that could be fair if she let them know four years ago, right? Oh, yeah. But she she straight up said, like, my voice changed. And then she immediately walks it back later and says, I just don't like the opera. (laughs) Which is something I feel like you can know more than way too close to the time where they're actually prepping the show. It's like you should have listened to it way sooner. You literally had years to listen to this. Well, I don't know how you sign a contract without knowing at least, you know, you don't have to know the whole opera. But I don't know that I would sign a contract for a show I didn't know I hadn't listened to. Right. And maybe she had listened to it, but she I guess maybe she hadn't listened to the actual role of Norma as something she was going to right. do. Yes, of course. But it's like, wait, what? <laughs> Wild. Speaking of uh, pulling out of operas, sometimes it's the singer's choice and sometimes it's not, which our most famous example is good old Kathleen Battle, right? Probably our most notorious modern diva and not in a glamorous way. Although I do kind of feel like she's kind of made a comeback in the last couple years. I feel like she's a little older and maybe a little wiser. I don't know. Definitely. But I feel like this is one of those stories where it's like we all know the Kathleen battle messed up big time, but sometimes we don't actually know exactly what happened. I think most people know that video of her where she walks out of the interview when they yes. ask her about it. Yeah. True. But basically, in 1994, she was kicked out of the Met's production of Fille du Régiment because the company said that she had unprofessional actions during rehearsals, right? So... The Mets general manager at the time said in an interview that when he dismissed Battle, he wanted to cancel all other offers that had been made for the future. So literally just cut ties goodbye. Um, And he basically went on to say in a formal Met address that Battle's unprofessional actions during rehearsals were profoundly detrimental to the artistic collaboration among all the cast members. And I could not allow the quality of the performance to be jeopardized. Um, And basically he goes on to say that he wanted everyone to be able to rehearse and perform in an atmosphere that makes it possible for them to perform at their best. Now, Take a second and think about some drama that you may have experienced as a singer yourself and then think about how bad it must have been for the Met director to say and publish that about you. That's like, that's shocking. You know, we talked about some public burns earlier in this episode, but to make an official Met address where you have to say this singer was so unprofessional that we just have to cut ties. She was detrimental to other artists here. I think the easy way out is to say, we've had artistic differences, so we've decided not to continue this contract together. That is not what he said. No, and it's it's worded in such a diplomatic way that almost makes it worse. Yeah, because it's not trash talk. It's just like you have to understand the facts of what happened. Here. Yeah, like factually, she was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, put that on my grave. <laughs> Actually, she was a mess. But then what made me laugh is that Battle's management basically issued a statement and she was just like, I was not told by anyone at the Met about any unprofessional actions. And to my knowledge, we were all working out the artistic problems in the rehearsals. And I don't know the reason behind this unexpected dismissal. So Kathleen is just like, wait, what? I was unprofessional? How? So unexpected. But then the tea gets hotter because... All of these people from the Met anonymously shared the problems and basically Battle objected to attending the two or three daily rehearsals that are typical in the weeks before a production opens. And they had to do a bunch of rescheduling to fit her schedule. And when it was totally revamped to suit her, according to these anonymous people who were involved, said she arrived late, she left early, or did not show up at all. She is said to have demanded that the other singers leave rehearsals when she was singing, and it was described as being, quote, very nasty to members of the cast, which is just, like, wild to me. I just love that she's, like, the living version of that scene from Mean Girls where he looks over at Tina Fey and he goes, don't look at me. <laughs> so true can you imagine that like you demand people leave a rehearsal so you can sing like why people are gonna hear you sing yeah that's kind of the point yeah it doesn't really make any sense and also like i feel like it's pretty shady for you to have the schedule revamped for you and then 
still be all over the place. I mean, you know, huge diva behavior. Like once again, that's that is the 1994 equivalent of asking to change an opera the week before to like rewrite an entire schedule around you. Yeah. Like having watched people try to make schedules when we were in grad school and try to like accommodate everyone's schedules to make someone redo it all just for one person. Like what a nightmare. Yeah, it's so rough. And Fille du Regiment, Fille du Regiment is not a small cast. Oh, no. Like you have a huge male chorus that's got to be worked in. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And it's like, once again, this is the thing that we love Rudolph Bing for, is that he was like, no, no, I don't care who you are. You don't get to miss rehearsals. And here she is missing rehearsals left and right. And it's funny because I think we always think of that as like the, the pinnacle example but she actually has a bunch of other legacy examples of her behavior. So, like, a year prior, Battle stormed out of a rehearsal of De Rosen Cavalier at the Met after a dispute with the conductor and told the general director that if he did not come to her dressing room to hear her complaints within five minutes, she would withdraw from the production. The general director did not appear, and she just straight up quit. So, like, big diva energy. And even a few months earlier... Miss Battle was in my home turf, and she opened the Boston Symphony Orchestra season, and she reportedly banned an assistant conductor and other musicians from her rehearsals. She changed hotels several times, and she left behind what a report in the Boston Globe called a froth of ill will. And basically, like, all of these record executives have complained about her demands to have her cover photos retouched, literally delaying her CD releases by weeks and she's just like a mess to try and schedule with so literally her tantrums are just so well known at this point it's crazy i kind of wonder like how do you have a career at that point so i just can't imagine like storming to a dressing room and being like i'm gonna hold my breath until i faint because that is like what is happening here if you don't come to my room in five minutes and hear my complaints. <laughs> you know, and changing dress hotels and everything. Like, it is it is just so over the top. Yeah. And repeatedly arriving late to the Met. Who does that? Like I said, this is not artistic disagreement. Because this is also just not, not how adults handle things. No. Listen, we've talked about it. There are a lot of petty things that happen in opera. And that's pretty much how all things are dealt with. I can't imagine handling anything that way. <laughs> this isn't even necessarily petty. Because, like, no real wrong has been done against her in any of these situations. That we know of. That, that we know of. True. That we know of. There's so many people who have talked about working with Kathleen Battle that I can't imagine that... We've all collectively lied. Yeah. I can't imagine it's all, like, completely out of nowhere, you know? Yeah. I really don't think that you get publicly kicked out of the Met without there being some fault. Nobody had such a public battle with the Met as Kathleen Battle. Like, I I can't think of anyone who had as big of a fallout with them. Oh, yeah. It takes a lot to get the Met to make a public statement. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for joining us. I hope you guys enjoyed this little hot gossip episode. (laughs) Michelle and I are no longer friends, so podcast's done. Well, if you've enjoyed um, Jesse and I's past friendship, then... um... <laughs> Which end is, ended in this episode because of Beverly Sills. The next episode is actually just Michelle trying to convince me that Beverly Sills is the greatest soprano to have ever lived. Okay, I won't say that she's the greatest soprano <laughs> to ever live, okay? I never made any sort of claims <laughs> such as that, but she is to be applauded at every <laughs> level. I love her. Anyways um let us know if you want more episodes like this if you're not already following us on instagram facebook and or twitter then you need to be that's where we post lots of fun content and get you guys involved in our episodes so follow us at opera off stage and if you want to check out some more stuff we have lots of goodies on our website you can check that out at opera-offstage.com and while you're at it you know if you're feeling spicy leave us a review we hope you guys have a great day thanks for joining us again bye bye